Anyone who's ever done anything worth doing has dreamed big, failed mightily, and mostly started from humble beginnings. This is a podcast about such people. The most fascinating podcast in the world is fascinating because of the stories of the human beings. Hello, everybody. It's Pat DeCerbo, the most fascinating podcast in the world. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the guests on the show who are willing to talk to me. And today we have Linda Sanford. Linda was a IBM executive for many, many years. And I had heard about Linda from my good friend, Nick D'Onofrio, uh, for many years. And uh, he would refer to her and other women at, at IBM who uh, were early STEM executives. And then I read Nick's book, If Nothing Changes, Nothing Changes, where Linda is prompt. Prom featured prominently throughout the book. And so she and I got to know one another a little bit subsequently, and she graciously agreed to speak to me today. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Pat. It's great to be here with you again. Terrific. Um, so I'm in the habit of asking people um, their earliest memories. Like, what are your earliest memories when you were a child? What do you remember? Oh, boy. You know, um, there were many, many memories, but some of the earliest ones were uh, growing up on the farm, which is what uh, we all did. Uh, my family uh, was a um, uh, grandparents in particular owned a farm out on Long Island and um, where my parents. Um, it was actually uh, on the very far end of East Eastern Long Island on the North Shore. So the town, very small little hamlet actually called Laurel. Uh, and he had about 125 acre farm out there. And um, and our family grew up right next to uh, to him on the farm. And um, my sisters and I, I come from a family of all girls, uh, but my sisters and I used to help out on the farm, you know, all year long, whether it was during the actual harvesting season or even in the winter, as we were helping to package up various uh, vegetables, potatoes, and so, so forth, uh, to send up to the New York City markets. Hmm. How old were you when you started working on the farm? Oh, I bet you I was six years old. Mm. Um, I, I think I was actually driving tractors at eight years old, <laughs> believe wow. it or not. <laughs> Uh, of course, it was on a farm. It was mm -hmm. not on a road. Uh, but uh, yeah, we we uh, we had to do whatever was needed in order to uh, to get the work done. That's great. And you have four sisters. You're one of five. Yes, that's right. Um, so yes, we were a family of all girls. I'm the oldest. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my four sisters, um, we... Um, uh, three of us were very close in age, and then there was a little bit of a break, and then the last two sisters. Um, so uh, we we were uh, and still are very close as a family. Um, mm. And it's interesting, but uh, all of us ended up uh, going on to college. Mm -hmm. Now, our parents nor our grandparents ever went to uh, to college, uh, but they were quite determined to make sure we did go to college, and we all did. And mm. uh Interestingly, we are all uh, math and science and uh, engineering majors as well. Interesting. What was uh, did Were there early indications of a proclivity for math and science, like when you were? Yeah, you know, I think when I think back of that, Pat, I think there were a couple of things. First of all. Um, my mother used to do all of the books, the financial books for the local school, as well as the local church. And so she just had a knack for mathematics. Um, and so that was kind of ingrained in us from the very, very beginning. Um, and then as, you know, we were working on the farm, um, it was basically a, a potato farm, but we also had several acres of just vegetables, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and squash and so forth. And uh, we would sell vegetables on the stand in front of our house every day. Uh, 
Hmm. And um, now selling vegetables means you have to know math. <laughs> you mm -hmm. need to know if they're buying two bushels uh, or two quarts of a vegetable, um, how much is that going to cost? And if they give you, if it's $2.50, but they give you $5, what is the change? And so we had to learn the math. Mm. A lost art today, I think. Yes, I know. <laughs> Among cashiers, at least. <laughs> exactly. Even with the, uh, even with the calculators on the uh, cashiers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you went to the local high school in town? In yeah. Um, you know, we went to Catholic schools. My okay. sisters, so we're a Catholic family. We all went to Catholic schools. Um, and um, the uh, the schools were very, very good. Um, we, uh, one was, it wasn't exactly in town because Laurel, as I said, is a hamlet. So we were in Riverhead, which was the larger town, which is just 10 minutes away. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then when we graduated again, uh, we all applied to colleges and um, we were fortunate to receive scholarships uh, back mm -hmm. then, which certainly did help. Uh, and again, um, like in my situation, I said, I'm going to major in mathematics. Mm -hmm. I went to St. John's University, um, mm -hmm. which was in Queens, still is. I'm mm -hmm. still very actively engaged with them as well. Um, but we went to, uh, I went to St. John's to major in mathematics. And then I'm thinking about what am I going to do with math now? I mean, mm -hmm. other than teach. And certainly, you know, teaching was um, one of the bigger, you know, uh, jobs that, that people would take back then. But I wasn't quite sure I'd have quite the patience <laughs> to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I took enough courses to get a teaching degree, um, I decided I was going to go on to get a master's. And my master's were going to be in operations research, which is the actual use of mathematics to solve kind of business problems and to build uh, some um, uh, uh, models around uh, how do you optimize manufacturing and production and so forth. So I ended up uh, going on to get my master's degree. And then from there is when I got the job, uh, fortunately, with IBM. What was the job with IBM? Yeah, you know, it was... Um, I'll never forget this. This was a a, a job uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, so, um, and it was working with typewriters. And mm -hmm. it was how do we lay out the keyboard on a typewriter to optimize the actual typing by an individual. Mm. And so it was in the engineering side of the business. That's where I had, had started. Um, and um, I was there, I think I was the only person hired that year um, and um, was um, a, a rare p woman who was in the engineering department there as well. Um, but it was the start of a great, uh, a great career for me. Where was that sort of uh, at the beginning of the electric or electronic typewriter? Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and this was back in 1975, mm -hmm. um, and so um, and and we we you know it was getting toward the end of our of our uh, you know uh, work with typewriters, uh, but we mm -hmm. did it for several more years, um, and then uh, from there we started to do printers and copiers mm -hmm. in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And we moved that uh, engineering and production work to Boulder, Colorado, and I moved with it. So mm -hmm. I was only a year in Lexington, Kentucky, and then after that, moved to Boulder, Colorado, where I worked on copiers and printers, um, and that was uh, about a 10-year stint at that point. Mm -hmm. So what was it like as a young woman engineer going into Kentucky at that point in time as a production yeah. engineer, I guess you would say. Yeah, you know, it was very, in, very interesting. I mean, um, I loved it. I loved uh, the people that I worked with. Um, and I felt very welcome, actually. I mean, I was the only woman. Every time I'd look around, it would just be me. Um, I remember one of the things, Pat, that I had thought about early on. I was like, so how do I get to 
know, to really know more more of the people that I work with uh, other than at work. So how do we get, you know, build some relationships, friendships, and so forth. And um, and I, I was also, um, you know, I think growing up on the farm is where we also started playing basketball, my sisters and I. Not that mm-hmm. I was a pro in basketball at all, but I, I grew to love that that game. And going to St. John's University, also an excellent, you know, basketball program. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the sports kind of activities, which we had at that time with IBM. So people would gather after work, they'd participate in, you know, sports, so we could do some fun together and then go out and have dinner together. Um, But again, there were no women's teams. It was Mm -hmm. all men's basketball or men's baseball or, you know, whatever. (laughs) So I decided I'm going to go then coach a men's basketball team. And that's Mm -hmm. what I did. I ended up coaching um, a team. um, And that's, you know, it it was just a great way to get people to be comfortable with each other for me to be comfortable with them, because I had to work with them every day. And I wanted to get to know them as people. uh, And they also to get comfortable with me. So um, it, I think that made a made a, a a big difference for me in terms of you know how I felt in the environment and the opportunities and you know people being comfortable with me as well. Mm-hmm. So when you made the move to that that was in Kentucky when you did the coaching. Or? Yes, yes. So when you made the move to Boulder. Uh, did you continue coaching? Or? We did have some 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 teams as well. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. But there we were doing much more skiing. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> we were literally, you know, Boulder, Colorado is at the, uh, you know, very close to some uh, great ski resorts um, in the area. And uh, I mean, I, I remember when I would go into work and park my car in the parking lot, every car had their skis on the top of the roof because mm-hmm. right after work up they would go skiing so that was a lot more uh, snow skiing uh, day in and day out but you know it helped because the a lot of the team I had worked with in Kentucky moved to Boulder Colorado mm-hmm. so you know we had known each other gotten to know each other and we continued that friendship mm, interesting how long did you stay in Colorado 10 years actually mm-hmm. yeah 10 years um it was uh it was a very um uh, it was a very interesting um opportunity there as well i mean so when i went there it was not working on typewriters but it was working on copiers and printers mm-hmm. um and i remember one of the first um things i had to do was to help um my my responsibility was to develop a color inkjet printer mm-hmm. and um uh, I had an engineering team who was terrific, who actually designed that coloring jet printer. But we actually had uh, the manufacturing being done in Japan. Mm. And so I would literally fly every other week to Japan from Boulder, Colorado for nine months until we had everything lined up so we could, okay, the the, the printer is designed. And we've communicated and shared all of that with our our our, our um, partners in uh, bold uh, in uh, uh, Japan, and they started manufacturing. What was that like working with the Japanese? That was also a first <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, Japan too. I mean, they um, mostly all male. I remember I would, you know, when I would be there, um, I I would be the only female in the room again, um, and um, but but again I, you know, I think Pat, what what helped me back in those early days, I remember one of my first uh, managers at IBM, he had sat me down one day and he said, you know, we're just talking about the job and the role and so forth, and then he said, Linda, at the end of the day. Just be yourself, mm-hmm. be yourself, and that really that really struck me um, and stuck in my head my whole life, my whole career mm-hmm. and um, so that's what I did. you know I am who I am, 
Um, and uh, so I would go to Japan. I, I wasn't afraid to ask questions if I didn't understand something or if I needed better explanation. And that got the teams over there comfortable also, I think, uh, working with me and I working with them. So mm -hmm. it was – I loved it. I mean, Japan, I, I think I was the first um, person to ever be invited to uh, one of the Japanese leaders' uh, home for dinner. And mm. um, and back then their tradition was, you know, the wife would make the dinner and serve the dinner. And she did sit down and have dinner with us. And then after I got up and I was, told, you know, taking the dishes and going to the mm -hmm. wash the, the, the sink to wash them. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> you can't do that. Um, but I did. <laughs> but it was uh, and I and likewise, when they would come over to Boulder, Colorado, because we would, you know, go back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, uh, from each other, um, I would have them to my house for dinner as mm. well. So um, it was a great experience. I loved Tokyo. Mm. I loved Tokyo. It was a great, and still is very great. You get back there occasionally? I haven't in a while, but I think this is one of the trips that uh, where I'm going to take again once uh, things settle down around the world a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so. Um... You were 10 years in Boulder, and then what happened? What was next? Well, uh, then, um, after that, I was asked to um, come back to New York. Um, and again, as, as I said, that's where I was born and raised. Um, and so I did come back to New York, and I worked on in networking. Again, all of these early businesses I've 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 worked with, whether it was typewriters or printers or copiers or networking, they're no longer part of the IBM, you know, business mm -hmm. uh, repertoire here. Um, but that's what I did. I worked on networking um, and um, I was in uh, up in Kingston, New York. Um, and then I eventually ended up uh, working in Bold, uh, Poughkeepsie. Uh, New York. So, um, but I, I I lived in Westchester during those times, and I would I would do the commute. It wasn't that bad of a commute going opposite the uh, the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, there, I got to work with um, a woman executive in networking, um, and um, so it was it was uh, it was a great experience. First time to have a woman to work with and be my boss. Who was it? Um, Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, and Ellen had, um, she, she was terrific. I mean, she was one of our first leading uh, women mm -hmm. engineers also. She had that background. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I worked with her um, for a while and she was located after a while in London. And so I would travel to London and we would have meetings there. Mm -hmm. And again, um, we ended up selling that business and moving out of it after a while. So. so there came a time, at least from what I read in the book, that Nick D'Onofrio, as part of the one of the major transformations of IBM, mm -hmm. that he called on you to be uh, part of a collaborative effort to move IBM into the next phase of its development. What yeah. do you remember about that? Oh boy, that was a, uh, and Nick is a terrific, terrific person. He he was my mentor for many, and still is, I consider him my mentor to this day. Um, he brought me in, and, and that was, I got to know Nick when, I guess actually the first job when I moved back from Boulder was working um, in the CEO's office where we had executive assistants um, who worked and, you know, did a lot of work for our CEO. Um, and Nick was kind of in charge of the group of assistants, executive assistants. Um, uh, and so that's how I got to know him. And, um, you know, Nick. Um, Could I stop you for a sure. moment? Um, when I think of an executive assistant, I think of 
someone who's a secretary. Work, right. <laughs> yes. And so it was a different terminology at IBM, wasn't it? It was. It was. It was actually we did we we were given projects, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, clients visits. We had to prepare the CEO for a client visit or we followed up on something that um, was a to do coming out of one of his other uh, client visits. Mm-hmm. So it was it, and we had you know, probably group of, I don't know, eight to 10 of us from different parts of the company all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So we got to know um, a great group of people. And then Nick was kind of, you know, the mentor keeping us all together and and whatnot. So it was a great experience. Um, Made a lot of connections. Yeah. He was the liaison. Yes, he was. Yes, he was the, he was the, the head of, of, uh, of all of us there. Um, So that, that that is where um i got to know nick um mm-hmm. and he got to know me and so you're right go down a few more years and um after kingston um um the mainframe this is when in the early 90s pat if you remember mm-hmm. uh ibm hit the proverbial brick wall mhm yeah the um, demise of ibm oh, was in every we magazine were, oh we were on the cover of fortune magazine as a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll never forget that. Um, And um, we had brought in a new CEO at the time um, from, who was not an IBMer, Lou Gerstner. Mm -hmm. He brought us in. We brought, he came in and he, he led the, the, the transformation and the turnaround, but, and he was terrific and still is terrific. Mm -hmm. Um, But to do that, we had to go back and rethink about the mainframe. And that is where Nick and Nick brought me in. Um, we needed to say, hey, um, what happened here? We needed to step back, starting with talking to clients, number one. I went out, uh, when he put me in the role to reinvent the mainframe, and I was there for five years, the first thing I did was go to meet with clients. Mm-hmm. Um, Four days a week, for weeks on end, for months, I would go visit with clients. And I would say, first of all, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry if we let you down. Um, and could you explain to me, you know, what your requirements are, what your needs are, so I can best understand them. And then, you know, we'll come back with what we think we need to do in order to address your needs as a business. So four days a week, I'd meet with them two, three clients um, a day. And then on Fridays, I bring my management team all together in the auditorium into the conference room and say, okay, here's what I learned this week. Boom, 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 boom. So what are we going to do? Who's going to take the lead on that? Who's going to take the lead on this? Um, And we just worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And we laid out um, a new strategy and a new plan in order to be better at um, delivering the value that our clients were looking for. And, and the basic issue there was that our mainframes were built using bipolar technology mm-hmm. and the speed, we were coming to the end of the speed of that technology. Mm-hmm. And so we needed to move to new technology called CMOS. The challenge was CMOS was not up to even where bipolar was at the time, but it had a long, much longer runway than bipolar. Mm-hmm. So we had to build a strategy that would help kind of, you know, get us moving forward, um, keeping our clients, holding on to them, helping them, but also in investing in the new CMOS technology. Um, and the team did that. They were able to do it. Um, and it's still, uh, you know, mainframe over 60 years old today. So it's a great story. I mean, it's uh there's so many players in the book. Like I feel like I know the story a lot better now having read the book. Mm. But uh you lived it every day. And it was the stakes were high. Yeah, they were. You know, one of the other things, Pat, um and I did this obviously in in Poughkeepsie as well, but this is the other thing I did starting in you know, my very first job in, in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was because I grew up on the farm. And at the end of the day, my sisters and I would turn around and take a look at 
all of the rows of vegetables or fruits or potatoes that we had picked that day. So I did this starting with day one in Lexington. I would walk the manufacturing floor. I was not in manufacturing. I was not doing any work there, but I would walk the manufacturing floor every day before I went home. I did that with uh, typewriters. I did it with copiers, with printers. I did it with mainframes. And there I learned from the people who were working the day to day. Since I was in engineering, I said, uh, is there things we can do to help the manufacturing process be smoother, be better, be, you know, more secure? Give me feedback. And I would also tell them what we were working on or what we needed. So we had developed a, a relationship where we were sharing, you know, information at the core of where it all happens. Mm. And, um, and I just enjoyed also just getting to meet the people and getting to know them as well. That's great. So what was next for you? Uh, and then after that, I actually went to run sales. Mm. <laughs> now, <laughs> I always, I always tell the story of, um, you know, in in Catholic high schools, we always had to go sell chocolate bars. You know, that was a thing we did every year. You know, that was some something of a little bit of a made a little bit of money. Um, and boy, I was like, how am I going to do that? I don't know. So I would always have my father buy all the chocolate bars mm. <laughs> so I could deliver on my quota, <laughs> if mm -hmm. you will. So when uh, I was asked to go run sales, I was like, whoa, <laughs> really? Um, although I knew I loved working with clients, I knew so many mm. clients and, and my days, you know, I was in I was in mainframe on for five years. Mm -hmm. um, that was the other, I think, great experience for me, having to go lead a transformation um, and lay out a new strategy and then execute it. So it's not just saying, okay, here's what you got to do. And okay, see ya guys. I'll, you know, I'm going on to the next thing. You had to actually execute it. Mm. And that taught me an awful lot. Um, and so, um, you know, and as I said, it included working with clients a lot, you know, to get their input and their feedback. So taking on the sales role, while it was a little bit, you know, gee, I'm not sure I'm that really good at that. I did enjoy working with clients. Um, so I did. I led um, sales uh, for mm -hmm. a couple of years. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this was, uh, you know, again, during the time where, you know, we had the new made frames coming out. A lot of the clients in the big industries that use them, like financial services or healthcare, you know, a um, lot of connections there. So that was a great experience. I built even more relationship with clients at that point. In, in Nick's book, it talked about how there were these cheaper alternatives that a lot mm. of these um, financial services companies, I guess, in particular, were attracted to, um, but just didn't have the durability that would have been necessary for the long haul. How did you it, sell yeah. against that? Yeah, I, I mean, because we had to be able to and that's a, uh, I mean, that is exactly what happened. I mean, they, they, they were all of a sudden these cheaper, you know, smaller um, capabilities that were out in the marketplace. Um, we had to be able to demonstrate, again, what the value add was that we would bring to the market. And that was not just uh, the durability of it, but was also the security of it. And you're talking about financial, you know, businesses, banks, um, investment companies, they needed to ensure that there was also security, um, you know, in the systems that they were running all of their applications on. Um, in the early days before we had CMOS up to snuff in terms of the kind of performance that was required, um, we had to really work with our clients in order to demonstrate to them, here's where we are, here's what we're coming, here's what you'll be able to do. Um, so hang in there with us, you know, we will be able to get you there. So it was a lot of conversations with clients, sharing with them our game plan and where we were, bringing them into Poughkeepsie to show them um, the progress we were making here. 
and counting on those relationships in order to, you know, stay with us as we made this transition. And they did, for the most part, they did. But to me, that's part of the most fascinating part of your story, and Nick's, is that you had this huge pressure um, internally at at the clients where <laughs> they had people on their boards or IT people in their own organizations pushing for a cheaper, more nimble solution. Right. And yet you and Nick and others stayed the course on this more expensive, more durable, more comprehensive long-term solution, uh, spending hundreds of millions or billions in capital to do it. And it was kind of a race. I mean, the book was like a page turner <laughs> at times, even though I knew at the end what the what happened. <laughs> right. It was amazing. Like you had to be so disciplined during that process. Yeah. 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 What was that like? Um, you know, it re it was, I mean, it kept us on the mark. I mean, it, because it wasn't like we had time or, you know, we could just, you know, dilly dally and it'll come when it comes. No, we knew we had the pressure. We knew it was not only pressure on the mainframe business, but on the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of communication um, that we had with our team, with our people, um, explaining to them what clients were worried about, explaining to them what we were hearing from clients, um, and then um, making sure that they had that as their kind of, you know, um, uh, goal and, and, and targets that we've, we can't let these clients down. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would bring in clients to speak with the team. Mm -hmm. I I had my senior um, engineering and 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 teammates, business uh, team, actually assigned to a one or two of our key clients. So there was the ability to pick up the phone and call each other. Call Nick. There was a relationship. For example. Yeah. But at the same time, there's wars going on at the board level at IBM saying. <laughs> We're not 100% sure that Nick and Linda have the right outcome, and maybe we should sell this division. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and good thing we didn't. I mean, as mm. I said, Pat, look, today it's still here. I mean, now it's into the quantum. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've got um, AI work going on with, you know, I mean, it's um, and I have to say and I and I say I think about this a lot. We stay, by the way, and I'm sure you heard this from Nick as well. Nick and I stay very much in touch with the mm -hmm. team in Poughkeepsie. We get together. Mm -hmm. uh, periodically just to, you know, have dinner together and collaborate and just, you know, um, we had built a very, very strong, very resilient team. And I often say it was my kids at the time, <laughs> you know, meeting the young people in the, in the organization who are now leading that mainframe mm -hmm. business. And they have continued to reinvent the mainframe as we move along here. And that's why it is over 60 years old today. So you get together with the team that you had, and the new t and the team and that's the here, new... both. Yep. Do you get yep. together as a group, old team and new team, or do you get together as a group. separate? Yeah, oh, all, all right. together. Oh wow. yeah. Oh yeah. And I think it's you know, I think people, even the new team, they hear the stories about the old <laughs> about the mm -hmm. old team too. So there's you know, it uh, it, it was. I mean. This, I mean, we had to go through. I mean, I did the first layoffs ever in IBM. We we never had layoffs, mm. but we had to back mm -hmm. then in the town of Poughkeepsie, which is right. not a huge town. Right. I mean, you walk the street, you you run into somebody's family. No you doubt. You know. So, again, we we, yeah, but we stuck together. I mean, we were built closer and closer bonds. Um, you know, and that is why I think the resilience is still there today and ha has been passed along even to the new folks who are coming through the organization. So what is IBM up to today? Well, it is, you know, a big piece of it is on AI, generative AI. 
and mm-hmm. building, you know, the models. I and I have to say, I, again, I am. For me, it's it's this, you know, the data analytics and the models you can build. I'm excited. That's what that's what I majored in in operations research, mm-hmm. my master's. I remember too. Um, I was so excited about you know building these predictive models and you know being able to help guide decisions that were being made so when I joined IBM it was you know not not when I was in Kentucky but in Boulder I remember just kind of talking to people about gee maybe we can start building some analytical models it will kind of help us maybe optimize the design or costs or whatever and everyone would say oh no we don't need that you know we ha- we know what we're doing here so we can we can you know just keep moving along and when I thought about it, when I think back, it was because the world was, it was moving much slower. You know, you could kind of watch change happening. Um, you could kind of see the implications it had on what you were doing and then decide what you're going to do and still not be late to the game, to the new mm. game. Fast forward to today. Nope. I mean, things are moving so much faster and so much unpredictably. Um, so that's why data analytics, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence that leverages all of that is so critically important. Mm. And I think that the only thing that I that I that I really and by the way, it was back in the early days, it was leveraging all of that on the back office kinds of functions like manufacturing. How can I, you know, um uh, you know, predict, you know, how do I uh, optimize the production of my, you know, copiers or printers. Um, But today it's, it's, it's how we do everything. It's leveraging technology, gathering data. And so you can build models that actually are, are very, very predictive and even prescriptive in terms of what you should be doing before to get ahead of the game. I Um, I was in a speech recently with uh, Rich Templeton of mm-hmm. Texas Instruments, mm-hmm. Union College graduate, by the way. Ah, okay. And uh, <laughs> a young person in the front row was interested in a career in tech. And mm-hmm. he said, Mr. Templeton, what advice would you give to a young tech entrepreneur? And Rich didn't hesitate. He said, decide fast and correct as you go. Exactly. There's no longer the luxury, as you pointed out, of waiting and seeing what happens. Yep. Um, it has That's to be a exactly constant right. course correction. That's exactly right. Agility. You need mm-hmm. agility. You got to keep going. You're going to learn. You're going to make some mistakes. Make them mm-hmm. early, hopefully. So you learn from that mistake. Always mm-hmm. get to the root cause of what happened. Mm-hmm. Fix it and move forward. And And I think the other thing here, the other very, very important aspect of it, and I remember having this debate with one of the brilliant people at MIT on, on these models. You still need that human element. Mm-hmm. You still need that human element. Yes, your models can kind of give you insight into what could happen in different scenarios. But at the end of the day, the human being has even broader perspective that you need to apply to that. So it helps you get more information, more more data, more facts that you can make a better decision with. So so you cannot forget that human element. So more data is useful, but not in a vacuum? Right, exactly. I mean, you want to know where'd that data come from? Uh, you know, what was the source of it? Um, how was it... Um, protected. Um, You know, you have to have all of that in order to make sure that what the outcome that it's predicting or prescribing is based on, that is based Mm -hmm. on some good, hearty, you know, solid information. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, um, but, but I remember when, and that was not one of the variables. So maybe I have to make a little bit of a, of a tweak here or there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what was the sort of the final chapter of your career? I feel like there was one more chapter. Yeah, yeah. the final chapter, um, it was the last 10 years. I was, I was in IBM for 39 years, so it was my last mm-hmm. 10 years. 
and that is when um, we were uh, the, the the world was opening up um, globally, and people were you know looking at getting talent and and um, capabilities from different countries around the world, and so. Um, IBM said, you know, we need to be a globally integrated company. That means we need to look at where we can source talent, like in India, uh, source manufacturing capabilities, like in China, um, and so forth. And so, but we also needed to, therefore, rethink and transform the business if we were going to do something like that. And so... My job was to lead the transformation of the company to become a much more globally integrated business. And that transformation, um, again, I learned a lot of what I applied from my mainframe days and and some of the earlier positions I held as well. And so um, the transformation approach that I that I often talked about was a three-legged stool. We needed to think about how do we do work? How does work get done? And do we need to rethink that process um, to make it more efficient? Uh, Why do we have so many different general ledger systems across all of our businesses? Can't we, you know, zero in on one, save some money and apply it to some new um, areas of innovation and invention. So thinking how things get done, where they get done um, was number one. Number two is now how do I apply technology to those processes? Um, And the third was all about communication, about the culture of an organization. Because again, you know, you want to be able to make sure people understand why we are transforming. Otherwise, I mean, they could they could be sticking their heels into the ground and not moving forward into the new direction. Mm-hmm. So those were the three legs of the stool of the transformation. What do we do? How do we do it? How do we leverage technology? But also, how do we ensure that we have the buy-in, the culture um, with our people, who are the people at the end of the day who are going to execute it and make mm-hmm. it all work? And so um, – I mean, it was, uh, again, as I said, I, I leveraged a lot of what I learned in my mainframe days in, in the application there. Um, and by the way, that's where I finally was able to really deploy a lot of operations research and data analytics. We had created a team that started to working with our research colleagues to build models that could start to predict things and help us make better decisions faster. Again leveraging the human knowledge and experience as well. Mm. So you decided at some point that you had had a career and you decided to hang <laughs> up your spikes, so to speak, at least at IBM. Yeah. Yeah. I, as I said, it was 39 years. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a uh, great 39 years. I mean, I never felt like I never had one job. It was so many different jobs. Um, I got to meet so many different people um, inside and outside of the company. Um, and um, again, I, you know, we had a, a new team of of people who were rising up in the company that, you know, also had um, brought a great set of experiences with them. And and I thought, well, now's the time. <laughs> now's the time. But so I loved it. I mean, I, I um, but and as I said, I, I still stay in touch. I mean, IBM was much like family. Um, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it was um, and still is to this day. So. Mm. So when you have these dinners, like how many people will show up? Oh, oh, close to 40, 50 people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds like a um, party. Yeah, exactly. I mean, which is which is you know a lot uh, when you consider it's been a long time <laughs> since we've been there, Nick mm-hmm. and I. Yeah. How do you keep busy these days? I think you told me. Yeah, yeah. I have. Um, so I, I, I mean, 
I thought it was time for me to move on, but yet I knew I wanted to keep still my hands into things a little bit, not, you know, around the clock type of thing. But uh, uh, so I I have been on boards, uh, public company boards. Um, I've been on uh, several, uh, probably five or I think five of them now over the course of the years. I'm now at two. uh, So I've also started to, you know, Come, come off of a few of them again as uh, time goes on. Um, but uh, the two boards um, are it's very interesting. I mean, in all of the, actually all of the boards I've worked on, they were Can all going Can you say what they are? Yeah. I mean, one is, um, it was um, ITT way back when. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was um, uh, uh, Relex, the old Reed Elsevier that was London based. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Con Edison, Pitney, uh, Pitney Bowes, and Interpublic Group. So there are five. Those are the five public company boards. I was on a. I'm still on a not-for-profit of the New York Hall of Science, which is focused on engaging the next generation in STEM fields. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm I'm still the the two boards I'm on now are both uh, Interpublic Group and Con Edison. When you think about those, they're all very different industries, very different industries. And yet they had to transform, leveraging, again, technology and bringing data and analytics into each of their uh, businesses as they move forward here. So I I very much enjoyed everyone, still enjoy them. Um, and it was bringing that experience of transformation, leveraging technology and so forth and data uh, to those boards that um, was exciting for me. That's great. And do you, um, you said you spent a fair amount of time out on uh, Long Island, the North and East end. Yeah, I do. I, I have a house out there near where I grew up and, um, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not out there fully full time yet. I I will eventually, but, uh, right now with my boards, they're New York city based. So it's, you know, much more convenient for me to get into the city from Westchester. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the summers I'm out on Long Island a lot. Um, and, um, you know, my, uh, my, two of my sisters have houses out there now. So three of the five have houses out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's again the North Fork um, is still still f- rural. Um, now it's changing clearly. Not as many farms. The farms that are left are actually most of them are relatives of ours <laughs> uh-huh. having grown up there. Uh, but a lot of them are now vineyards too. Uh, okay. So they've and then a nursery. So they've stayed rural. You know they're mm-hmm. not uh, uh, becoming big uh, complexes. Uh, and it's great to be out there. Uh, I love the water. I love the beach. Um, so it's great. That's terrific. Is there anything? Um, is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything you might like to talk about that I haven't asked about? No, and you know, I think uh, again, um, the experiences that I've had um, were they, they left an impact on me. I, it, it, it taught me a lot. It helped me a lot as I moved forward. Um, but it also let me be me. And I think that's the biggest thing that um, when I think back and say, what was one of the, you know, it's be yourself. And, uh, and that's what you look, if you don't feel like you're, you know, can say what you want to say or suggest something or, um, you know, maybe even make a mistake every once in a while and learn from that mistake. Um, I think you're going to get bored and, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, frustrated with what you're doing here. So that is why um, I think I stayed with IBM all those years. That's why um, I've learned so much and stayed close with those with those folks. Um, even even people from my days in Boulder, Colorado and <laughs> Lexington, Kentucky. So mm. um, it's been a great, uh, great career um, with lots of wonderful memories here. Mm-hmm. 
It sounds like you got some good advice and then you decided to let you be you. Yeah. You took yeah. the advice. Yeah. I have a kind of a story. When I was a kid, we used to go roller skating quite mm -hmm. a bit with a good friend, my best friend at the time with his mother. And um, she was a fantastic roller skater. But when we would go, she would always fall down mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, her name was Mrs. Daly. And I said one day, Mrs. Daly, you're such an elegant roller skater. Why do you fall down? I don't understand. And she says, because I have to get loose. If I don't mm -hmm. fall, I can't be loose. And it was just interesting, oh, you know, wow. like I can make a mistake and it's going to yeah. be okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, look, you, it's, it is how you learn. And, and, and again, this is again, <laughs> learning from my grandfather, um, you know, uh, root cause analysis. I mean, back then we didn't have the automated farm machinery like they have today. Mm -hmm. So we would literally have to walk every row uh, 125 acres and pull weeds by mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, my grandfather would say to us, girls, let me check your fingernails. Mm. And if there was not dirt under the fingernails, I know you didn't get to the root of that weed and it's going to grow back again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and root cause analysis. And it was, it left such an impression on all of us. You're right. We're mm. going to make mistakes. I mean, sometimes uh, you have to vie, you know, in a new direction. And, of course, you're going to hit a bump along the road. But that's okay. It's not sometimes. It's all the time. All the time. It's all right. the time. But exactly. we, we're in a, you know, a society where I think, uh, maybe this is just me, but they tell us we can't make a mistake. And I, I've sort of taken the position that it's always going to be hard and I'm always going to make mistakes. Yeah. And that took the pressure off me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and again, the thing is, and, you know, learn from those mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's what I'm also teaching my, I have two granddaughters. So we have, we have mm -hmm. girls in our family, girls, mm -hmm. girls, girls. <laughs> I had the one son uh, mm -hmm. and a daughter. Um, but my two granddaughters, I'm always, you know, math and root cause analysis, and why did that not work? And make sure <laughs> you mm. check it again. Um, it's uh, it's so something that is important. Yeah, yeah. they're going to be ninjas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm fond of saying, the most important punctuation in the English language is the hyphen. It's that which is between your date of birth and your date of death. What would you want people to know about Linda Samford? In the, in the end well you know I think I think the big thing is I've been saying is that I was and I am who I am um, and um, you know I was was very um, fortunate to have the opportunities I had starting with the family that I was raised in and then the people I got to work with and and um, build relationships with over the years. And um, I, I, I hope, and I, I've talked with many other women that I've mentored uh, about the being yourself, um, you know, thought here, how important that was. Um, and I hope they can see that in me, that I was myself. Um, and it was okay, <laughs> that it worked mm -hmm. out okay. Um, and um, and I hope more and more people are like that. Hmm. It's a great, I, my opinion's irrelevant, but I think it's just a great final thought. You know, the pressure of not being oneself yeah. is just so intense. Oh. You know, divided loyalties between the person I am and the person I think I exactly. should be. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't work too good. <laughs> no, no, no. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit, and uh, I hope our paths will cross again soon. Well, Pat, thank you. I really appreciate the time and I, uh, the conversation we had, and it was great to see you again as well. See you soon. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. If you enjoy the most fascinating podcast in the world, please follow on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, and follow on Apple Podcasts.